Don here again. Um, <clears throat> I figured since tonight is Halloween, uh, I try to, uh, I've been working on this, um, this study all day to try and get it ready for this evening. So maybe there's something edifying. I I'm sure there's several edifying things that will be out there, but this will simply add to the edification of something decent that someone might want to listen to while all the uh, goofiness is going on. Um, this will be a study that <clears throat> certainly other people have done a better job of, but maybe it's uh, some information that uh, you, haven't, uh, you haven't heard or you need a uh, little more information about it. The subject that uh, it's, it's a little elusive and requires some study um, but unfortunately like so many other things that are worthwhile studying the study is uh, you have to find the books that you can't find in your local library or bookstore you know what I mean um, now the Bible Baptist the Bible Baptist bookstore the one that I keep uh, promoting they will have um, almost all of these all of the books that um, I used uh, and they have actually more books I don't think I have every every book on the King James Bible from the Bible Baptist bookstore although I've tried to do that <laughs> um, but nobody else really other than the Bible Baptist bookstore so it's a tough subject to uh, to try and study um, now the main subject that eventually I'm going to get into it has to do with the editions of the King James Bible and other subjects uh, that we'll hit on that has to do with your King James Bible. Uh, so let's get into it. Um, why is the King James issue so important? Well, 1 Corinthians 1.10 is why. 1 Corinthians 1.10, uh, Paul, writing to the church, that's us, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is pretty important. This isn't just, you know, I think this would be a good idea, guys. No, he's saying this is what you need to do. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak, speak the same thing. How are you going to do that with all kinds of different Bible versions? And that there be no divisions among you. How are you going to do that with different Bible versions? but that ye be perfectly joined together. How are you gonna do that if you don't have a perfect Bible that you're all, you can all be perfectly joined together in? In the same mind and in the same judgment. You cannot obey Paul's admonition in 1 Corinthians 1.10 unless we all have a King James Bible can't be done can't be done um, Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 um, verses 3 through 6 endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace you can't have unity if you have 10 different Bible versions going on and, and then uh, four other people trying to say, well, the Greek word here is and the Hebrew word here is. That's not going to be unity. That's going to be division and it's going to be confusion. And the Lord is not the author. The author. What's an author? He writes books. The Lord is not the author of confusion. So God didn't write all those other Bibles. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit, capital S, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, how come you can have uh, one body, one Spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one real baptism, that's one saving baptism. That's what he's talking about there. There are seven baptisms altogether, but that he's saying there's one real baptism, which is spirit baptism, Colossians 2. 
But how do you wind up with one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, um, but you don't have one Bible? Isn't that weird? The Lord says that he holds his word above all his name. Um, the Bible, without the Bible, you don't know how to get saved. Without the Bible, you don't know how to please God. Without the Bible, you don't know how to prepare for the judgment seat of Christ. Without the Bible, you don't know what the gospel is. Without the Bible, you never knew what Jesus Christ said. The Bible is very important. So we need to have one Bible, as well as all of those other one things that God gave us. Uh, Philippians 3.16 tells us to walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Notice that it said walk by the same rule. R-U-L-E. Huh. Rule. That's the Bible's word for ruler. Or tape measure. Do you ever use a tape measure or ruler? Do you fabricate? I mean, even if... Do, do you do... Uh, do you sew? Do you, uh, do you make dresses and things? Or do you fabricate wood and make tables? Or um, do you do metal fabrication? Uh, a number of things you could think of here. You use a tape measure, don't you? And you have exact measurements. Exact measurements. And the Bible says in Philippians 3.16, let us walk by the same rule. The same rule. The same measurement. In Isaiah 44, 13, the carpenter stretcheth out his rule. See, this is the when the Bible said rule in Philippians 3, 16, it was talking about like a ruler or a tape measure because it gives the cross reference to Isaiah 44, 13 with the carpenter stretcheth out his rule, R-U-L-E. He maketh it, uh, he marketh it out with a compass. So he's making sure that whatever he's making is going to be exact and balanced and correct. Um, I know whatever I try and make, uh, in fact, I got a, um, my, my favorite ruler, my favorite tape measure is made by Milwaukee. And I like it because it gives the exact measurements right down to the millimeters. It doesn't just give sloppy measurements, it gives exact measurements. And I need those. Because if I'm off a millimeter, I've got a sloppy, you know, if I'm even, even trying to make a box or something simple, it comes out sloppy. Amen? The rule, R-U-L-E, is to give God's perfect measure. God's perfect measure. Exodus 26. Exodus 26. I do believe Jesus Christ was a carpenter. I do believe God has always been involved in building things and making things and creating things. God has a perfect measure and he insists, he insists on a perfect measure. Exodus 26, verse 1 and 2. Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twine linen and blue and purple and scarlet with cherubims of cunning work, cunning work, shalt thou make them. Just like the uh, King James translators, they weren't just... Uh, slackers. They weren't idiots. They had cunning work. Verse 2. The length of one curtain shall be eight and twenty cubits. Exact. And the breadth of one, one curtain, four cubits. Better be four cubits. And every one of the curtains shall have one measure. God didn't want the cur curtains to have ten different measures. He didn't want the curtains to have 200 different measures like your Bible versions. He said, I want these curtains to be made exactly like this, according to this measure, according to this rule, and I want them all to have one measure. Uh, verse 8 here. The length of one curtain shall be 30 cubits, and the breadth of one curtain 4 cubits, and the 11 curtains shall be all of one measure one measure not just over here and over there and let's change it here and let's change it there no god's gonna have a perfect measure he's gonna have a perfect rule and that's the way god is so um you need a perfect bible it's never up to man's whim or man's standards 
when it comes to God's tabernacle, God's furniture, God's altar, God's ark, right? You ever read the Bible? He's specific, like we're reading here. Or God's book. God's book must be made according to God's perfect rule down to the millimeter. You better have a, a Milwaukee tape measure for that, amen? No, no sloppy measurements. God's rule is down to a perfect measurement. Now, um, you hear a lot about Greek. Well, I, I did a little bit of a study, and I hope this isn't complicated for you, but it just, it, um, I hope you get something out of this. Um, just a little bit here. It, Greek or English? Greek or English? Huh. Well, um, Anglo 1, Saxon 2, and Gothic 3 are the great, great, great grandfathers of English. And they were major world languages at the time of Christ. Okay? The Anglo, the Saxon, and the Gothic. The Gothic <clears throat> was one of the languages um, spoken in Acts 2. If it was a major world language at the time of Christ, let's look at Acts 2. Let's look at Acts 2. Turning, turning, turning. I got my big note Bible here. Uh, Acts 2 and verses um, 6 through 8 say, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we, hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya and about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So the Gothic um, was a, a major language at the time of Christ. Um, and so, obviously, there there would have been um, some Gothic being spoken to at, through these tongues uh, to uh, these uh, Jews of the dispersion, or not of actually the dispersion, they were, they were um, spread out, and they were already all over the place, and then they would have to come back to um, Jerusalem um, at certain times of the year. Uh, but they were they had these different languages and they heard them speak in all these different languages that were that were mentioned here in Acts 2 for the day of Pentecost when they went there for that feast day. Um, the Goths, the, we're talking about the Gothic language, which was the great great grandfather of English. The Goths migrated into Scythia and became part of the barbarian. Scythian people mentioned by Paul in Colossians. Paul mentions the, barbith, the barbarian and the Scythian. The Gothic is much like English in pronunciation of its root words and even in its spelling. It often sounded and looked just like English. Part of the barbarian people, talking about the Gothic language, Part of the barbarian people were the Celts. England was dominated by the Celtic Britons, the Celtic Britons, 500 years before Christ. All right, old, ang old language there. In 55 BC, in comes Rome into England. Okay, we're talking about England, the English language. In 55 BC, Rome comes in, bringing the Old Latin into England, as in the Old Latin Vulgate, that very authoritative source that um, they used in uh, for translating our King James Bible. Not talking about Jerome's Latin Vulgate, but the Old Latin Vulgate matches our King James Bible in many, 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 many places. 
And that came in via Rome into England in 55 BC. So all this talk about Greek, uh, you, you, got a, you got a good thing with your English. Rome departs from England in 410 AD, and by 449 AD, the German tribes called Angles, Saxons, and Jutes come in. That's where you get your Anglo-Saxon, or Old English. The Anglos, or Angli, are mentioned by the Roman historian Tacitus, who lived in 55 to 117 AD. So English is the ancient widespread language, much richer than mere Greek. I just wanted to give you that. Um, don't think that there's something real magical about Greek. If you study the history of the English language, uh, and I just gave you a real poor history, but maybe something that you can, you know, use, uh, you know, one level and get into, you know, 10 levels from there with that. Uh, you can kind of see that um, English has its history. It has its roots very, very, very deep. It's widespread worldwide and it's very old. Um, I want to read, let's see, I'm going to read here out of, uh, a quote out of Gil Ripplinger's book, The Hidden History of the English Scriptures. Um, and the anyone that tries to downplay Gail Ripplinger or talk bad about her, uh, they are just jealous. Okay, that's all that's going on. God used Gail Ripplinger just as he used women in the Bible to, uh, to put a tent peg or a, a mill scale uh, through the heads of scholars. When someone is an enemy of God and is messing, messing with God, God will tend to use a woman, uh, a, a, a demure, ladylike woman, to take their head off. He did it twice in the Bible. Well, and he's going to do it a third time in the Bible. If you're talking about the body of Christ likened unto a woman, coming back with Jesus Christ as his bride, to crush the head of the uh, the serpent, the Antichrist. And God in the early 90s, I remember this, this is when I got my Bible back. My family got their Bible back. Um, in the early 90s, God was really moving with the King James Bible and correcting these scholars. And he brought along this very ladylike, demure, quiet uh, Gail Ripplinger, gave her some kind of... Um, illness or disease. I mean, she was bedridden for quite a while, and that's how she got into all this. And God gave her stuff that is thick. It is deep. And the the um, the naysayers that I've heard, that poo-poo Gail Ripplinger, funny thing is, I don't hear this deep stuff from them. I don't think they could even handle the deep stuff from Gail Ripplinger. But he used her. Never doubt that. And he did it because it was so embarrassing to these, these scholars correcting, these male scholars correcting the King James Bible. First, first God brought along a junkyard dog to bite their seat, seat of their pants out called Dr. Ruckman. Then he brought this sweet, demure, ladylike, dress-wearing lady, quiet-spoken, and she just quietly took a, net, uh, a nail of a tent peg, put it up to their skull, and drove it right through their scholarly brains. All right. Let me read this passage here. Um, the translator's sources, like old covered bridges, paved the way for those early explorers traveling from Greek, Hebrew, Gothic, Latin, and Anglo-Saxon to English. Their meticulous efforts need not be retraced. We, we have now arrived and rest in the King James Bible the glorious seventh and final perfected English Bible. Like wisdom, which crieth upon the highest places of the city, in November 1921, this is before Ruckman, 1921, issue of the secular magazine Ladies Home Journal published an article entitled Human Nature in the Bible by Yale professor William Lyon Phelps. His article expressed the popular view saying, quote, 
our English translation, talking about the King James Bible, is even better than the Hebrew and Greek. Ooh, he was a Ruckmanite when Ruckman was just a brand new baby. Imagine that. There is only one way to explain this, he says. I have no theory to account for the so-called inspiration of the Bible, talking about the King James, but I am confident that the authorized version, the King James Bible, was inspired. All others are inferior, quote unquote. This is from uh, pages 8, 166, and 167 of the November 1921 Ladies' Home Journal, if you want to find that somewhere. Um, now let's go on to, the, this is just a quick study here, uh, just hitting, hitting some certain things that I think are important, maybe you think are important, just some stuff that maybe you don't hear a lot about. The these and thous of the King James Bible. Here's another thing that the naysayers come along. And, oh, I just don't understand the these and the thous. Well, what, are you uneducated? Are you dumb? I mean, hey, look, I'm just a garbage man and a welder, and I get it. How come you don't get it? You must be dumber than a garbage man. Well, let's read another. Let's read another quote. Um, here's a quote from uh, John Wesley Sawyer. The Legacy of Our English Bible. And by the way, both of these books can be found at the Bible Baptist Bookstore. Um, are thee, thy, thou, thine important in our Bible? Have you noticed the first words attacked are the pronouns thee, thy, thou, thine? The pronouns are important in the Bible. It is God's law and very exact. If a pronoun begins with TH, it is singular, one person. If it begins with Y, ye, you, yours, it is plural, two or more. The Greek, Latin, Hebrew, and all languages have the singular and plural. English does too. But it is not used much today in bastardized English, outside the Bible. Some call it archaic, but it is very important. If you sing, How Great Thou Art, with you instead of thou, it is how great you are. It means two or more. That can include other gods, Satan, humans, etc., God is one, not plural. If you alter, if you alter thou to you, you corrupt the message. Um, I'm going to read. I'm going to read again from uh, Gail Ripplinger's "The Hidden History of the English Scriptures." On this, the King James Bible's built-in English teacher provides 11 different forms to communicate 11 different parts of speech. She's smart. New versions, new versions jumble. They're clumsy. They jumble all 11 into five forms, making Bible comprehension very difficult. My, my own insertion here, they make it harder to read, not easier to read. Okay, she says uh, they make it very difficult. The King James Bible simplifies, simplifies grammatical comprehension because it retains the words which automa automatically identify parts of speech. One, thou, which is a singular nominative. No, uh, nominative. Two, the which is a singular objective. Three, thine, which is a singular possessive pronoun. Four, thy, which is a singular possessive adjective. Five, ye, which is a plural nominative. Six, you, which is a plural objective. Seven, your, which is a plural possessive adjective. Eight, yours, which is a plural possessive pronoun. 
9, right, which is first person, as in I. 10, rightist, which is a second, plur second person, as in thou. And 11, righteth, which is third person, he, she, or it. Words that are singular, now I want you to get this. Words that are singular have one T stick. So imagine the letter T as a stick here, okay? Words that are singular have one T stick. Like thou, that has a T. Thee, has a T. Thine, has a T. And thy, has a T. Words that are plural have a Y stick whose top is broken into two branches like ye, you, your, yours. Most languages, including Hebrew and Greek, are what linguists call synthetic. A single word, love, blends its meaning with an ending called an inflected ending, e.g. lovest, which indicates that it is a verb, an action, or being word, and identifies the verb's subject. The first person is I love. The second person is thou lovest. Est um, S for second person. And the third person is he, she, or it loveth. T for third person. It is all as easy as A, B, C. Modern English and New English Bibles are not synthetic. They are what linguists... See, we're not just making this stuff up. They are what linguists call analytical. Analytical. The reader must analyze them, hoping for clues from the word order to determine what part of speech a word is and what word it modifies, e.g., first word, I, love, second person, you love, third person, he loves. Who does love, you or I? Such subjective conclusions do not suit the Bible where private interpretation is forbidden, 2 Peter 1.20. The Word of God is a legal document. Jesus said, The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day, John 12.48. Modern language substitutes are not precise enough. It is imperative that these endings be retained because a verb is sometimes separated from its subject. The endings make vital theological distinctions. The King James Bible is the only English Bible that speaks and spells like most of the languages in the world. It is international English and is God's bridge to reach a world now clamoring to learn English. Just go online and, and click on other countries, uh, Philippines, uh, Japan, and watch them walk through the streets in real time. You'll see more English than you do seeing their own characters. All right. Reading the EST and ET, ETH endings is the only way to show important grammatical and theological distinctions clearly seen in Greek, Hebrew, and many foreign Bibles. Missionaries love the KJB because its EST and ETH verb endings match those of many of the world's languages. These two have S in the second person and a T in the third person verb endings. The KJB's becamest is wordist in wordist in modern german those who speak greek german spanish french italian portuguese yiddish and many other languages know that an s is the ending means second person singular the use of a t 
in the ending also signals the third person to many. In addition to the matching ending letters, the word for thou in many languages is a T or D, word like TU or DU. These match the KJB's T in thou. The U in modern Bibles will not communicate the uh, not communicate to non-English speakers at all. For example, the KJB's thou givest mirrors the German du du gibbest d u g i b s t. The new versions you uh, you give will be unrecognizable. Likewise, the KJB's thou findest matches the German du findest d u f i n d e s t. It's thou redeemest matches the Italian to redimesti, T-U-R-D-I-M-E-S-T-I. And it's thou lovest, lovests, matches the Spanish T-U, uh, or tu amaste, T-U-A-M-A-S-T-E, not the new versions you loved. The edge of the sword and the edges of words are critical. They sever the true from the false. Isn't that good? The sword. They sever the true from the false. Jesus is the beginning and the ending, even in his word. I am the ending, saith the Lord. Revelation 1.8. The KJB is biblical English, not 17th century style. Shakespeare's plays written during the same period did not use the ETH and EST endings. Um, The preface to the KJB written before 1611 by the translators does not sound like the King James Bible. It says, your very name, not thy very name. The KJB translators use the, ye, thy, thine, ETH and EST endings or verbs in the Bible because these are the only way to show important grammatical and theological distinctions clearly seen in Greek Hebrew, and most of the world's Bibles. KJB KJB English is Biblical English, not Archaic English. Amen. But American Christians, as you know today, are not only ignorant of these things, they are simply hypocrites. How many of them have you heard singing uh, America the Beautiful? America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood. They can sing that. I wonder how they're able to do that. I would think they would get very confused. What am I singing? Or how about how great thou art? How do they sing how great thou art in church? Or many other hymns? that use King James-like language, these thous. How do they do that? It's hypocrisy. They have no problem with it. The editions of the King James Bible, okay? The editions. Um, and there's going to be other people that are going to do much better, um, much better studies on this, but let's get into this. The editions of the King James Bible. The basis of modern King James Bibles are from Cambridge and Oxford. Only four editions of the King James Bible can be termed revisions. The first three published by Cambridge University Press, the fourth by Oxford by Oxford University Press. The first one is uh, 1629, the second 1638, the third 1762, and the fourth 1769. There have, al- there have always been three agents authorized by the British Crown to print the authorized King James Bible. One, the University Press at Oxford. Two, the University Press at Cambridge. And three, the Royal Printer. Now, this is not why the King James has been called the authorized Bible. It was called authorized because everyone recognized it as the final authority. 
Even Westcott, the heretic, <laughs> the Bible corrector, even Westcott had to admit in the 1800s, quote, from the middle of the 17th century, the King's Bible, talking about the King James Bible, has been the acknowledged Bible of the English-speaking nations throughout the world, simply because it is the best. A revision which embodied the ripe fruits of nearly a century of labor and appealed to the religious instinct of a great Christian people gained by its own internal character a vital authority which could never have been secured by an edict of sovereign rulers. So Westcott knew uh, that the King James authorized version was not called authorized because King James authorized it. It was authorized by the body of Christ. It was authorized because it was the best. And Christians knew it. And they knew that it was the authority. So it was called the authorized version by the body of Christ. It had nothing to do with uh, the British crown um, authorizing it. The 1629 edition, the Cambridge Folio edition of 1629, reads as the 1611 with different spelling. Uh, it has 447 changes in spelling that were done. Um, this isn't correcting the text. This isn't changing the doctrine. This is uh, as the, the um, as English was solidifying into a perfect, pure language. Uh, it had to go through. It had to go through this change. So spelling, spelling at that time, uh, in the early 1600s, was anything but standardized. There was no standardized uh, English writing at the time. English spelling, uh, punctuation, and so forth. Uh, so they, they made the 447 changes in spelling that were needed um, part of the purification process. Uh, one of the things that they did was they introduced the letter J uh, where it replaced the I. Um, introduced was the, I'll write, read it just as I wrote it. Introduced was the letter J. It replaced I when I represented a consonant. And the use of the letters U and V was standardized. You would see in, in some older writings, older English, um, I suppose German too, uh, where V V and U, uh, or you know, like V and W sometimes in German are, are switched around, right? So they corrected that. Uh, the editors of the 1629 edition were anonymous. They're not really sure who they were. Uh, undoubtedly, they were individuals who were um, instrumental in the original 1611, and then they came back and did what they needed to do. Um, the second edition, the 1638, uh, the Cambridge Folio edition, Samuel Ward and John Boyce were two of the editors who were also editors and translators of the 1611. This remained, the 1639 edition, remained the standard text of the King James Bible for over a hundred years. They inserted words or clauses that were overlooked by the editors of the 1629. You got to remember the way that, I mean, they had the printing press and, uh, I mean, just, you know, they didn't have the technology. So, you know, they, it was easy to overlook things, uh, words or clauses that needed to be there where they just forgot. And so they fixed that and they made 224 changes that became standard in the 1638 text. The third edition, the 1762 by Cambridge University Press, uh, edited by Francis Sawyer Paris, it was issued by Cambridge in the folio and quarto editions, from what I'm reading. Um, this edition introduces modern proper reading. And then you have the fourth edition uh, in 1769, 
This was published by Oxford University Press, edited by Benjamin Blaney of Oxford. The 1769 became the standard text, but the most accurate are those published by Cambridge. And I'll elaborate a bit as much as I can in a little bit. It's a little elusive. The 1769 was issued under folio and quarto. Uh, Blaney was no, a noted Hebrew scholar and writer who held four earned degrees. The 1769 Oxford edition had to do with modernized, standardized, and corrected uh, the text punctuation, spelling, and italics. Um, this isn't like a modern edition where they correct the, um, um, the doctrine. Nothing like that. Uh, Norton noted that there were 99 variants from the 1638 edition to the 1769 edition. Now, uh, Cambridge Bibles, if you've ever looked, I've quite frankly drooled uh, looking through the Cambridge Bibles, either uh, I would order their um, their catalog or look online. The Cambridge Bibles are sold under Cameo, Amethyst, Clarion, Concord, Emerald, Large Print Edition, Minion, or Pit Minion, which is the second edition of the Minion, Sapphire, and Turquoise. These are, the, these are Cambridge Bibles. The Oxford of 1769, okay, uh, does not capitalize S in Matthew 4.1. Um, this is how it differs from some of these Cambridge Bibles. The Oxford of 1769 does not capitalize S in Matthew 4.1, Matthew 9.27, or Mark 1.12, which you'll have to look up. The Cambridge Cameo edition does not have capital S in 1 John 5, 8, in Acts 11, 12, or Acts 11, 28. The Sapphire and Turquoise of Cambridge do not capitalize S in 1 John 5, 8. Neither does the large print edition, nor the Amethyst or Pitt Minion. The Cambridge Concord which I believe is the 1762 edition. Correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong on that. If you happen to know what the Cambridge Concord edition is, um, give me some information and correct me here. But um, I think the, Com the Cambridge Concord edition is, would be the 1762 edition. And it has a capital S in 1 John 5, 8, in Matthew 4, 1, in Matthew 9.27, in Mark 1.12, in Acts 11.12, and Acts 11.28. The Cambridge Concord edition matches the Ruckman Reference Bible. How about that? And in the Ruckman Reference Bible, in its introduction, if you turn to the introduction page, it says, quote, we have chosen the old Cambridge KJV. Okay, so that's the Ruckman Reference Bible text that they used was the Old Cambridge KJV. So they didn't use the Oxford of 1769. They used the Cambridge, and they and I'm I'm guessing that that would be the um, the Cambridge of uh, 1762, since that was the last Cambridge that was made. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so you, your Ruckman Reference Bible is even better than maybe you thought it was. Um, how do I know which Bible I have, you ask? Well, number one, does it say Oxford on the outside of it? Or does it see, say Cambridge? Now, it might say something else, and so you're going to have to uh, do some study, and you'll have to, if you have a Nelson or something else, you'll have to look through it and, and see what you have as far as and there's a lot more than just the, the capital S or non-capital S, uh, but you'll have to look through. But it'll say right on the outside or on the inside cover, Oxford or Cambridge. Um, second, uh, look at the first page that reads, quote, 
the Holy Bible, when you open your Bible, then look at the bottom left-hand corner. It'll say like Concord, or it'll say Cameo, or it'll say large print edition. I have them all. I have the Oxford, I have the Concord, the Cameo, the large print edition. It's easier to read the large print edition when you get a little bit older. Um, they're all good. I mean, look, uh, I, I really love purity. I love purity in the Bible. So uh, I really love my Rockman Reference Bible. I really love my, um, my Cambridge uh, Concord uh, Bible. Uh, I'm telling you, man, if you haven't, if you haven't done some, uh, some surfing on the internet um, at the Cambridge, Cambridge store, Cambridge Bible store, or got one of their, um, one of their, uh, brochures, like looking through a car brochure, man, <laughs> it really is. Instead of drooling over new cars, you're drooling over these Bibles. The, the best made Bibles in the world at this point are the, are the Cambridge Bibles. And recently the Ruckman reference Bibles have come out with some really nice ones made with some really high quality, uh, uh, covers, um, but the Cambridge, uh, the Cambridge also. I, I've spent, I've spent over three hundred bucks, I believe, on a goatskin Cambridge Bible, and I, it's still in the box. I take it out and very carefully read through it every once in a while. I don't want to just you know leave it cooped up. That's not right. But I'll take it out every once in a while, and quite frankly, I take it out and I smell it and I, and I look at it and I just I. I love it. I love it. Oh, biblical idolatry. Okay, whatever. Uh, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, you see how guilty I am. I'll take it. Um, the American editions of the King James Bible. What about that? Uh, the, you'll need to check them. Like I said, you'll need to check them. But God gave the, jo the job of printing King James Bible to England, not America. Out of America came very little of spiritual value. I mean, you've got PBI. You've got the Bible Baptist Bookstore. That's, you know, Dr. Ruckman. That came out of America. So that was good. Um, but most of the world's spiritual chaos and garbage, if you do some research, came out of America. So you better be, be careful. I would stick with... Um, you know, I guess your Ruckman Reference Bible comes out of America, but it's using a Cambridge text out of England. Um, so I would personally, if it was my choice, I'd stick with both the Cambridge and the Ruckman Reference Bible. And there's nothing wrong with the Oxford. I would, you know, if you can get an American edition, like at the Dollar Tree, where you're picking up, uh, you know, gift Bibles for pennies on the dollar that you can give out for literally like a buck. Well, hey, you know, come on, you know, use some common sense. God gave you a brain with some common sense in it. Um, but I'd stick with the Cambridge or Ruckman's Reference Bible if it was my choice. So I hope that was edifying. I hope you got something out of that. And, um, um, Hopefully this will be something extra tonight that you can spend some time listening to while all of the uh, Halloween uh, celebrations are going on. All right. Amen.